Good evening, everyone. Hi, welcome. Welcome um, the whole audience to our Facebook Live event. Tonight, we're gonna to provide a brief overview of cholangiocarcinoma. We're gonna introduce survey results and talk about some critical elements of a, um, the cholangiocarcinoma patient journey. Um, today's event is brought to you by the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation in partnership with the Insight Corporation. I'd like to introduce you to our panelists tonight, and we'll start first with Dr. Renuka Iyer. Thanks, Melinda. My name is Renuka Ayer. I'm a medical oncologist, and I uh, am also the section chief of uh, GI oncology at Roswell Park Cancer Institute in Buffalo, New York. Hello, everyone. And next, we'll go to our patient representative, Darlene Kalb. Hello, everyone. I'm Darlene. Thank you, Melinda, for inviting me to share my perspective with everyone tonight. I've been battling cholangioma for just under four years now, and I look forward to sharing my story with everyone tonight. Thanks for being here, Darlene. And lastly, we'll go to Kristen with Insight. Thanks, Melinda, for having me. I'm Kristen Bebo. I'm an epidemiologist at Insight, and I lead our global health outcomes team. I've been working with Melinda and the Car Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation for a couple of years now. And I'm happy to be able to share some of the findings that we've had from our survey. Thanks, Kristen. And I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Melinda Bikini, Director of Advocacy with the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation. And prior to jumping into our discussion, I want to quickly review the rules of engagement. The purpose of this Facebook Live event is to gather members of the cholangiocarcinoma community together to connect and to learn from each other. We encourage you to share your questions and comments in the comment section and we will do our best to answer and address them towards the end of our discussion. Unfortunately, we may not be able to respond to every question. And throughout the event, please keep the following in mind. We cannot provide medical advice. If you have specific questions about your condition or treatment, please talk with your healthcare professional. We will not be discussing products or medications as this Facebook Live event is meant for sharing disease education and not promoting any specific products. Please keep questions related to cholangiocarcinoma only. All comments will be screened based on these regulations. And lastly, please keep in mind that the information discussed today represents the experiences and opinions of the panelists and does not constitute medical advice. Not everyone will have the same experience. So now let's get things started. So first question, Dr. Iyer, can you kick us off by giving a short overview of cholangiocarcinoma? Thanks, Melinda. Um, cholangiocarcinoma, bile duct cancer, biliary cancer, all the same thing. We use these terms interchangeably. Uh, and this is a rare cancer. And so what is a rare cancer? It's one that affects uh, fewer than 40,000 people per year uh, in the United States. And as a group, all of these rare cancers constitute just over a quarter of all cancers. Um, so where does this cholangiocarcinoma arise? It starts in the bile ducts, and uh, it's a really the bile ducts are really thin tubes that are both inside the liver, outside the liver, and lining the inside of the gallbladder. And this bile duct is about four or five inches long. It uh, takes bile from the liver and the gallbladder and delivers it into the small intestine. And the main function of this duct is to take this bile and and the toxins in the in the from the waste from the liver and deposit it into the small intestine and also to help in digestion of fats uh, in our food. Uh, so when someone is diagnosed with bile duct cancer, um, the first thing the doctors try to do is to figure out how advanced it is or how far it has spread uh, from the bile duct or even within the bile duct, how deep it is. And, uh, and this process, the tests that someone has to go through to figure out how far it has spread is called staging. And uh, it's important to get that done up front and know exactly where it is because that's how treatment plans are made. And it allows us to know how serious this is and the questions that patients ask us about survival and statistics and all of that are really tied to an accurate stage. Thank you, Dr. Iyer. And next question to you is, can you tell us a little bit about why you think cholangiocarcinoma patients often face such a delay in receiving the correct diagnosis? 
Absolutely. Um, I work in a tertiary referral center. Uh, so many of the patients have been diagnosed, but it certainly has taken a long time. And many patients come to us when the cancer has already spread or it can't be removed surgically. It's advanced. And, uh, and, and that's unfortunate. But to help people understand why that is, um, it, it is it, despite all of us having so many advances in technology, now we have really top-notch CAT scans, PET scans, uh, ERCPs, ways to get into the bile duct. And yet there are numerous diagnostic uh, challenges. And one of them is by the time the patients come to us, it's often much later because at earlier stages, when it's sort of smaller, patients are very asymptomatic. They don't have any symptoms, so they don't go to the doctor. Um, and when they do finally start to have symptoms, they're so vague, upper abdominal discomfort, bloating, or some weight loss. And then, you know, that's so common that people don't make much of it. Or even if it's an abnormal liver function, there are other meds, we think maybe it's from that. Um, and there aren't really biomarkers, you know, for prostate cancer, uh, there is PSA. And uh, it is a common practice to screen using PSA in the blood. So there is a way to try to find it a little bit earlier. And unfortunately for bile duct cancers, we don't have that. And the other problem, and sometimes we know that there is cancer in the liver, let's say, and uh, we're not able to tell that it's cholangiocarcinoma because more often than not, 85% uh, of the time, in fact, when there's disease in the liver, multiple spots in the liver, it's more likely to be metastatic disease or spread from somewhere else. By somewhere else, I mean like breast or colon or lung or some other disease uh, site. And so because of that, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. You want to make sure that it's not that. And then you can say it's the other 15% where it actually started in the bile duct. And all of these tests can feel like they're taking forever. And that's part of, you know, the delay. Um, and I think, unfortunately, for most people that I've met, um, their diagnosis of cholangiocarcinoma occurs a little bit later at a more advanced, uh, you know, stage. And these are all the reasons that I can think of. Thanks, Dr. Ayer. I definitely remember um, them trying to rule out a primary diagnosis in me as well and scanning me from head to toe. Um, so now, Darlene, as a fellow cholangiocarcinoma patient, you have firsthand experience with what it's like to live with cholangiocarcinoma. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey to your diagnosis? Sure. My story does almost flow with the typical story that Dr. Iyer just went through. And mine began in uh, December of 2016 when I had some abnormal blood work come back. It was just routine labs. My liver enzymes were elevated, yet mildly elevated, and my primary care doctor did pick up on that, and so we repeated the test, and they did come down, yet I did report having some pain, mild pain, yet in my upper right side. Still wasn't too concerned, but we did have a ultrasound done, just in case, and it's a good thing we did, because that's when they noticed a mass, large mass in my liver. From there, a CT scan was ordered, and then I believe an MRI. And then I was sent to a liver specialist. Um, he did some, a few workups on me and did ultimately send me for a biopsy, which is that came back positive for cancer cells. And even at this point, they did not right away assume any kind of liver cancer. They assumed it had metastasized from somewhere else in my body. So then I was sent for more testing to include an ERCT. They searched all over for a primary cancer and couldn't find it, um, still not knowing what it was at the liver specialist. He referred me to an oncologist and that's where I was diagnosed. Um, it, they told me I had intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and allowed me right away to see the surgeon at their office thinking that perhaps I was a candidate for a resection. But immediately I learned I wasn't because of the nature of where the tumor was located. So all that I learned rather quickly, which is doesn't typically follow the story, but I'm grateful for that and and maybe a month. And I just learned from that day on, I really have a lot to learn and look into and research. Thanks for sharing that, Darlene. Now to you, Kristen. Insight sponsored a survey among cholangiocarcinoma patients that was recently shared at the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation's annual conference. 
Can you share more about the survey and what you were looking to learn about the disease and the patient experience? Sure, Melinda. So just to provide a little bit of background, this was a survey that was sponsored by Insight and conducted in collaboration with Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation. And what we sought to do was to get an assessment of the, the patient's experience and their journey uh, living with cholangiocarcinoma. So we sought to administer a 30-minute online web-based questionnaire, and we were fortunate enough to get responses from over 700 patients, which provided us a great deal of data from which we could, we could analyze. Uh, it was conducted in August and September of 2019, and our first results were reported out at the annual conference, as Melinda just said. Uh, the objective of the survey was threefold. So the first objective that we sought to, to look at or to explore was to understand the process of diagnosis for the cholangiocarcinoma patient. Um, the second objective of the survey was to evaluate and learn more about the different treatments and the patterns of those treatments that the cholangiocarcinoma patients uh, received throughout the course of their journey. But most importantly, what we really wanted to learn was how cholangiocarcinoma affected the quality of life in these patients. So we'll share a little bit about that. Great. And thank you to all the uh, patients who participated in this survey. We deeply appreciate it. Kristen, can you also explain what was captured in the patient survey regarding the cholangiocarcinoma patient journey to diagnosis? Yes, I think we're starting to hear a very similar uh, train of thought because our survey results also underscored what we just heard from Dr. Iyer and Darlene. So the survey showed that the majority of patients from the first onset to sim of symptoms until their official formal cholangiocarcinoma diagnosis was approximately 22 months, nearly two years between that first onset and the, the official uh, diagnosis. What a survey also found was that about a third of patients were initially diagnosed with a different type of cancer, which is important to note because it, it's, it's really critical to get the diagnosis right because not all diseases are treated the same way. That makes sense. Okay, Dr. Iyer, what should someone do once they're diagnosed with cholangiocarcinoma? Absolutely. When I see newly diagnosed uh, patients walking in, um, they're in a rush to get in. They're calling the referral office and saying, get me in like yesterday. And I can see why now from hearing about the survey that Kristen just shared, if they've already waited two years almost, you know, to get that diagnosis, time really feels like of the essence. Um, but I will say there's one thing that I really have to sort of give as a takeaway today to a newly diagnosed patient is it's so, so very important. It's critical that you see an oncologist uh, or a hepatobiliary surgeon, uh, a, a surgeon who basically does surgery on cholangiocarcinoma only or largely. And I think that that is very important. The specialists really know a lot about this disease and also there have been so many developments in recent years you want someone who's aware of that ongoing research and knows how to access it and make it part of your treatment um, program and plan and this may mean that you wait a little bit or you have to get a second opinion or um, go out of network or travel a little bit but i would really recommend that people do that when they're newly diagnosed it's important and it's also very important that people are aware of something called biomarker testing. Uh, this is basically a way to scan or study the DNA of the cancer cells. And, uh, and we want to find out if there are any mutations, that means abnormalities in the DNA, or other what we call molecular abnormalities. And this information can sometimes take two, three weeks to come back from the time that we order it. So it's very important that we kind of get that ball rolling and uh, it is used uh, as part of your treatment plan. And so I think these two things would be important to know really early in the game. Thanks, Dr. Iyer. And I'd just like to let everyone know to visit the cholangiocarcinoma website um, for newly diagnosed patients. There's a pathway there. Um, visit our specialist map that will help you find a specialist who treats cholangiocarcinoma patients. Um, also, there's um, help with finding clinical trials, and there's also the ability to connect with support networks. Um, all right, so 
Darlene, being diagnosed with cholangiocarcinoma is difficult, and because it's a rare disease, people can often feel like they're alone. How did you initially feel when you were diagnosed with cholangiocarcinoma, and who did you reach out to for support? Well, of course, I felt fearful and confused. I didn't quite understand the disease or what was ahead of me, although I did have a doctor that was very honest with me. Um, initially, I thought, okay, well, this is only in my liver. And I thought, well, that's a good thing. But I didn't quite understand cholangiocarcinoma or what it is or what it meant until I read up on it. And one source of information was I went to, of course, the internet, which we all know may or may not be good. <laughs> it was a resource for facts that were great, but it's not always the best place to go. Everyone's journey is different and there are so many options out there. Um, I did get much support from friends and family. Again, not specific to my disease, but emotional support, which is very important during this time. I also found a support network that was become a wealth of information through a Facebook group specific to my disease. Uh, one specific thing I remember, emotional feeling and early in my diagnosis was about a week later when I was sent to a local surgeon for an evaluation for a possible resection. He, he tried to explain things to us, but not very well. He was using acronyms and verbiage that we were not familiar with at all yet because we had only been in, my husband and myself, had only been in this journey for a week or so. Uh, specific examples might be the acronyms of RADONC and MEDONC, which just went right over our heads and he just kept on going. And um, later, of course, I found out those mean radiation oncologist and medical oncologist. And these were the things I was going to need to line up. And so I just remember that being a very overwhelming yeah, it's a whole new vocabulary that you've never wanted to learn, that's for sure. All right, now let's yeah. discuss the emotional toll living with cholangiocarcinoma and what it has on patients and the importance of having a strong support system. So Kristen, what did the survey reveal about the patient's mental health after their diagnosis? Yeah, so we did want to capture the social emotional burden of cholangiocarcinoma among the patients that responded to our survey. And so the way that we did that was to employ what we call validated tools to assess different symptoms. And one of the validated tools that we employed was a, a questionnaire that sought to understand symptoms that are or can be associated with major depression. And according to what we saw in the survey, there is a mental health burden that cannot be ignored in the cholangiocarcinoma population. The survey found that almost half of the advanced disease patients reported symptoms that were consistent with major depression. And we also found that even among all of the cholangiocarcinoma patients that participated in our survey, the vast majority said that the symptoms of depression made their daily lives at least somewhat difficult. And many said more than somewhat difficult. Wow, that's so, so hard to hear. Dr. Iyer, is this emotional toll something you observe in your patients and how do you proactively address this with your patients? Well, I feel like you and Darlene are so much more equipped to answer that. You've been there, you've dealt with it, but certainly as a provider being on the other side, I certainly see that toll, you know, on, on the patients, the families as well. And uh, sometimes even we struggle, you know, with how to bring it up, how to even ask, like, how are you doing, you know, beyond the just like, how are you doing, like in the hallway, you know. And I think just for, for providers, just knowing if the patient is ready to talk um, and just knowing where they are in their journey. Uh, sometimes uh, when someone's newly diagnosed, you know, they really are in that fact gathering sort of let's get a plan going kind of more. They're not quite ready to talk about the toll because they don't even know yet, you know, how they're feeling. They need some time uh, and others are more ready. They're at that place. And so I think just as a provider, gauging where that patient is, which comes with experience is, is important. I also find that I try to focus on symptom management uh, and I find that referring patients to like the CCF support groups. I give them your card because I have it. And uh, I try to make sure that their symptoms are managed because I think it's a lot easier to think about how you're feeling when you're not in pain or um, struggling with some everyday you know, issues. I've also seen patients uh, tell me, especially because it's a rare disease, um, 
that they're feeling very isolated. And even though I treat largely bile duct cancers, you know, the waiting rooms and things, they don't easily find someone else that has what they have. So they feel very alone. And I think that, you know, for these patients and for really any cancer patient, having trusting good relationships with their healthcare team, with my coordinator, the nurses, nurse practitioners, all of those things are important because sometimes they don't want to bother the doctor because they think I'm so busy. But they'll tell the nurses or they'll tell other people, you know, I think I need to talk to the social worker. I haven't told my kids or, you know, things like that. Um, and I think ultimately I want every patient. I know we don't always cure this disease. And so no matter what, we want patients to feel confident. We want them to feel that everything that could be done was done and that they were heard and that they had a voice and they were a very active participant in their care they feel sort of left out, like they're being told what to do, you know, it really takes a toll on them, you know, just because you have this diagnosis doesn't make your opinion less. Uh, in fact, it's more, it's the most important opinion. And I think that people have to feel that their questions are being heard properly and answered. And, uh, and I feel if you're having honest conversations and just calling the elephant in the room what it is, um, people feel the toll a little bit lessened. That's my experience. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Iyer. Kristen, can you also share some of the physical issues patients living with cholangiocarcinoma reported on the survey? Sure, yes. Yeah. So in addition to the social emotional burden that we captured in the survey, we also sought to understand the physical symptomatology that the patients were experiencing throughout their journey. So in addition to some of the tools that we used to assess that I spoke about earlier, we also asked a bank of symptoms where the patients were asked to respond whether or not they had the symptom and then how much that symptom had impacted their daily life. And for every single symptom that we put into that survey, we found that a, a majority of cholangiocarcinoma patients say that it had considerable or more impact to their daily lives, which underscores the dramatic impact that cholangiocarcinoma patients live with on a daily basis. Um, some of the symptoms that struck struck the, the biggest chord or stood out the most were uh, those that responded having fatigue or insomnia, anxiety, and loss of hair. And then in addition to some of the physical symptoms, we also wanted to understand in our patient population that took the survey, for those that were still trying to work, at least even part-time, what kind of impact cholangiocarcinoma had on their daily lives. And it was a, just over a quarter of our respondents said, that their, their journey with cholangiocarcinoma had a considerable impact on their ability to work. Thank you for that, Kristen. Um, I just wanna emphasize some of the things that were said, and I think um, most people with this diagnosis tend to feel like they are alone and they really do wanna connect with other patients who are experiencing what they're going through. Um, so the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation supports people living with cholangiocarcinoma and provides resources um, we have a great um, mentorship program called Calangio Connect, so I encourage patients to reach out and get connected to a mentor. There's also an international Calangio Carcinoma discussion board where you can um, ask questions back and forth. And we also have um, patients, like Darlene said, who visit the, the Facebook groups. There's private Facebook groups for patients, for caregivers. Um, and so please reach out to us and let us help you to get connected so you don't feel like you're alone. Um, all right, so we're going to switch gears a bit and talk about biomarker testing, which can be a critical in understanding a patient's disease early on and in his, her, and in her or his diagnosis. But it's often difficult to understand and navigate for a newly diagnosed patient. So, Dr. Iyer, can you tell us a little bit about what biomarker testing is and why it's so important? I just realized that I did exactly what Darlene said doctors do. I used the word biomarker and didn't explain what that is. <laughs> uh, so biomarkers are, um, are biological markers. So it's uh, something about the biology of the cancer or the cell that we're trying to study. It's uh, telling us something. And that's what we're trying to do. And newer technologies have now made it possible to look very closely inside each person's tumor to see exactly what mutations are present. And what's a mutation? A mutation is some sort of damaged or abnormal DNA that's sending a signal to the cell. 
So an oncogene is a kind of mutation that's telling the cell grow, like an accelerator that's stuck. And a tumor suppressor gene is one where the brakes have failed. It's supposed to tell the tumor, I'm suppressing you, don't grow, and it's not doing that, and it's therefore growing. And those kinds of mutations and some other abnormalities are very helpful in making a treatment plan. And, and this study is called biomarker uh, testing. And to do this, how is this done exactly? A sample of the tumor is taken from the tissue biopsy or if someone's had surgery for their cancer, then from that surgical specimen. And we take a little piece of that and we send it to a lab that will run those tests and tell us and give us this extra information. And it can take two, three weeks. Wonderful. So Dr. Iyer, for patients who are considering biomarker testing, what advice would you give them? I first try to explain what it is exactly. I try to draw it on the board in the room so they understand. Sometimes the picture really communicates or says it better than, than I can. I think also um, for someone that's new in this journey or is just hearing about this today or recently, I'd say start a conversation with your oncologist because that's the place from where this testing really begins. The oncologist has to order it or another uh, healthcare professional, if you're seeing a nurse practitioner or someone else in your team, and then they can sort of get that rolling in order and get the answers. And I think testing, the timing of testing is always a question I'm asked. So testing is done usually soon after the diagnosis of someone having a locally advanced, meaning not surgical, um, or a metastatic uh, tumor that has already spread, uh, because th those are the patients for whom these drugs are really used and it matters um, in their treatment plan. Um, another thing to um, also know is that, how is this gonna get paid for? This is always a question I get or a concern of patients uh, because um, you know they worry about it once they see all those bills. Uh, so I want people to know that actually this biomarker testing has uh, now an increasing role, not just in cholangiocarcinoma, but a lot of other cancers. And so insurance companies are more aware, and myself and many of the other cholangiocarcinoma doctors that sit on different panels that make guidelines, and I know, Melinda, you've also sat on many of these panels, uh, are all advocating and putting it in the guideline that this testing is necessary, and all of this is helping getting this covered by insurances and getting doctors to, to realize that this needs to be ordered because it makes a difference and making all of this more accessible. The other thing patients should know is that because we need tumor DNA to do this test and you need to have a certain amount of DNA to run the test properly, sometimes there's just not enough in that initial biopsy. It might have just been a scraping from the bile duct, so there's not enough. So they might have to have a second biopsy. So not to be alarmed, it's really you know, risk-benefit ratio, but it's probably got more benefit than risk. Um, so that's something they might have to do. And also in the journey, you know, we're starting to understand it more and more. And perhaps you or Darlene can speak to this more in your own experiences. We're thinking also along the journey of some of the patients who've done well, that the mutations might change. Some new ones may appear, some might go away. And so we might repeat that biopsy and sort of test it again. So these are just few things, maybe more than someone wants to know at one time, but um, but all useful little things that might play out in their journey. Awesome, thank you. Um, Darlene, have you had biomarker testing done? Uh, yes, I have. Um, as a matter of fact, I've had two, but they were not um, close to each other. The first one was ordered actually maybe two to three months after my biopsy. There was still viable tissue left in the biopsy that they saved, fortunately, so I didn't have to repeat that immediate biopsy. And that was completed. And then later, again, we repeated it about three years later, as Dr. Iyer said, in the event that I had mutations that had possibly changed or possibly new ones that popped up that could open up my possible, you know, my, open up my treatment plan to see if there was anything else available to me that wasn't available at the previous test. Yes, and I have also had my biomarker testing done several times throughout my 11-year uh, journey of living with cholangiocarcinoma. Um, so I also want to uh, direct everyone to some resources on the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation website. 
Um, there is a great animation animation video um, called biomarkersmatter.org. If you go to biomarkersmatter.org, you can view it. And it's, um, it's a wonderful animation that just explains the importance of biomarker testing. So I invite you all to visit biomarkers.org. Um, okay, so Darlene, patients should feel empowered to have open and honest conversations with their healthcare providers, which includes feeling comfortable asking tough questions as it can ultimately impact their care. Can you tell us a little bit about the relationship you have with your healthcare team and how do you typically prepare for a doctor's appointment? Sure. I do have a rather good relationship with my healthcare team. My primary medical oncologist is always there to answer my questions. I feel comfortable asking her tough questions. Uh, a really great resource that we have now that I'm, I'm comfortable with her is the My Chart Questions. I can email her quickly and I almost always get a response relatively quickly. Um, that's great that I'm her for that. Um, I've been seen at several facilities because of the specialty of the, the disease. And the, what I was pleased about is that my providers at all the facilities are more than happy to discuss my plan with each other, even though they're not at the same facility. And that was a surprise to me initially, and I was you know, pleasantly surprised about that. And that's needed to be done quite often. Oh, as preparing for the visits, I almost always write my questions down. That's rather important, uh, so I don't forget. Uh, because inevitably, in the kind of new will pop up, and I'll be reminded of it, and I can refer back to that list. I always have to write my questions down as well, darlings, because I always forget when I get there. So, Dr. Iyer, how can patients and phys physicians best work together? Darlene said, you know, you have to come to that comfort level and feel like you can ask, and, and that sometimes can take time. Trust takes time. And, uh, and doctors also have to uh, deliver on what they promise. If they say they're going to write back or call back, you know, we all have to honor our promise. Uh, we all get busy, but uh, well, we have to know who's waiting at the other end and, and what's at stake and, and make sure that we do our part, you know. Um, and studies have shown in terms of how do people do well, um, really people who have good support uh, in terms like fatigue is one of the very common symptoms that patients experience. And studies have shown that patients who have great support, uh, more so than even medications, uh, actually handle the fatigue better, exercise, you know, simple things. And I think that uh, patients who know that they have that support at home uh, are eager to, you know, fight longer, harder, better, and they feel like it's all worth it, you know, and all of those things matter. Good communication matters as well. Uh, in, in for anybody to feel that they are part of a team, they need to feel like they're heard, their voice is important. And, and that everyone's talking to each other, you know, timely communication, very important. Um, and I think also when patients clarify what um, they've heard, um, I know I've, I'm guilty as well. I, I talk fast, I have a little accent, uh, I'm often rushed. <laughs> and so, um, you know, just taking, I actually took a communication class and there they said, you know, make the patients say back to you what you, you know, think, they should know uh, so you're sure they actually got it because sometimes how we said it and how the patient heard it is not exactly the same and in that clarification I think everyone feels like we're on the same page we're saying the same thing and and everyone got it and I think each of those things has its place in making the relationship better those are good points Dr. Iyer so to both you and Darlene what advice would you give to those who are newly diagnosed with cholangiocarcinoma. Dr. Iyer. So um, for someone who's newly diagnosed, you know, um, we know, we know this is not the best day of your life. We know that you're coming in totally not who you really are. Um, but over time, you know, uh, we have to get to know you and you have to get to know us. Uh, if you're not feeling comfortable, if we don't know how to make you feel comfortable uh, and your questions are not being heard and answered in a way that you understand, then get another opinion. 
um, try and get a clarification from another member of the same team, set up another follow-up visit, maybe at the end of the day when the clinic is not so busy, you know, and get your questions answered until you fully understand you're not going to feel um, that everything that can be done is being uh, done. Um, and we, we know new patient visits are overwhelming and stressful, and you can share some of your own experiences. I know Darlene shared too. Um, having those extra, you know, pair of uh, ears, someone to take notes um, or just record everything we're saying. Now we have, all of us have smartphones. And if we write something down, just take a picture of everything we've written. And this way you have it uh, and you can refer to it, you know, later. Um, I also, you know, tell patients to tell me what's important to them. Um, we, we sometimes assume and we shouldn't. Uh, and I think that's also very, very important. Um, just today, for example, I um, saw someone and uh, his uh, son lives across the border in Canada. And now with COVID, they're not able to come across or they have to quarantine when they go back. And it's it's um, more so than the treatment plan, which most patients, when they come, you know, that's what they really want to hear. Like, what are we going to do? Um, but for him, he wants to know how he's going to see his son and how his son's going to come over to visit him and, and if I can write a letter to make that happen. And, you know, if that's what's important to you, bring it up. Talk about it. Let's let's do that first because then we can get to all the other things. And I think that that's very important also in a care plan for some people who have to travel or, you know, they're concerned about neuropathy, side effects. Tell us what it is and, and this way we can also, you know, work with you. Um, so I think ultimately the care plan will be slightly different for every patient, but uh, but know that your opinion and what you'd like and how you ask the questions will allow us to customize it to exactly what you want. Thank you, Dr. Aya. And Darlene, what about you? What advice would you give to those who are newly diagnosed? Well, first and foremost, I do agree that it's imperative that you have someone come with you to these initial appointments. Um, you're overwhelmed yourself and even though you're understanding it, it, it's best to have someone with you that can talk it through when you're done. Just to have another set of ears in the room. Perhaps you didn't hear something correctly. Perhaps you know you were concerned about another question at the time when it was being answered. And now that being said, I know now with newly diagnosed patients it's more difficult with the COVID restrictions. Uh, recently, I've been to several appointments where I, I was required to go by myself, and that would have been much more difficult for me if it was early in the diagnosis. But now I'm, I'm able to deal with it. But even so, I wish I'd had somebody else with me from time to time, even now, especially perhaps after discussing a scan, perhaps, things like that. Um, and my other thing is to always get a second opinion, sometimes even a third. Even if you're satisfied with a provider, even if you're happy with that person, Sometimes there's other opportunities out there that you don't know exist, and perhaps they don't know exist if they're not, you know, expert in cholangiocarcinoma. And that's the key, and that's what I've learned through these few years of my journey, that there are other choices, there are other options, and not everyone knows, or not every, not every option is available at every facility. And I would just add to that and say, don't be worried that your doctor will be offended <clears throat> if you said, I want an opinion, we're not offended. We're grown-ups. Uh, we would get an opinion if it was us. So you totally can go and get another opinion. And I know, Melinda, your story is a great example of someone who traveled and got another opinion. And, and look where we are. Yeah. Yeah, thank you both. That That's great advice. It's so important to seek a second opinion from an expert in this field. Um, so I just want to say thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you to our esteemed panel for the fantastic insights and robust conversation. I hope everyone tuning in enjoyed hearing from Dr. Iyer and from Kristen, who provided great expert advice, and from Darlene about her experience living with cholangiocarcinoma. So now let's um, go ahead and take some questions from the audience. So Dr. Iyer, could you give a few key questions um, a newly diagnosed patient should ask a doctor as they are seeking to find the right team? Um, 
That's a great question. I think a lot of you already do some internet research. So you do already know, you know, how long the doctor has been at that center and, uh, and um, practicing and treating, you know, um, bile duct cancers. And I think just if you haven't already done that research, just asking them, how long have you been in the field of um, bile duct cancer care and, and who all are members of your team? I think uh, just knowing that all the elements, radiation oncology, medical oncology, surgical oncology, uh, a gastroenterologist who has the ability to do ERCPs and put stents, an interventional radiologist, nurses who know how to manage tubes and stents are all very important. And when we work together all the time, um, we have a good communication, a good way of taking care of patients. And that would be my first question is, you know, who all are in your team and how do you guys work together? What are the numbers I should call? Should there be a problem? Um, so I think these are just like practical questions. And I think most of the other questions are around, you know, if I have questions, who would I call? And, and just, you know, um, what trials do you have? Um, how do we make decisions about treatment changes? How are those decisions made? And so those would be the things that are really practical points that perhaps would be very helpful for you as you move along the journey. Besides the two that we spoke of in the beginning, asking about biomarker testing and if that will be done and when that will be done, as well as the stage uh, and location of the tumor. All right, another question we had come in is, can biomarker testing be done with blood? Probably to you, Dr. Iyer. As, <laughs> as a matter of fact, yes, uh, it can be done with blood. Um, there's two things to note in blood biomarker testing. So the ones that you're referring to and the ones that I'm referring to are ones where we're looking for mutations and we're trying to find customized treatment you know, options for patients. And that blood testing um, does detect a number of mutations but the one that's done in the tumor is set up to detect some more. And so there is a little bit of, um, not negative, but a little bit of more information that can be obtained from the tissue test compared to the blood test. But the advantage of the blood test is that um, it's an easier thing to do and it can be repeated over time. And for the majority of the drugs and the majority of the mutations that are relevant that we're talking about, the blood test works just as great. Now, there's another thing that will also be done in the blood for some patients, and that one is to look at your uh, genetic risk for getting cancer. And that's a slightly different test, and perhaps that we can uh, address at a different time and a different forum. So those are the two kinds of blood tests that people will go through. The majority of what we're talking about here relates to treatment. So along that same line, the next question is, is cholangiocarcinoma hereditary? Mind reader. <laughs> and so <laughs> yes. the majority of cholangiocarcinoma, unfortunately, is not hereditary. But there are some genes uh, where there are family constellations of families um, where there is breast cancer and colon and other cancers. So there can be a small component uh, that is actually hereditary. Okay, wonderful. Another question that came in is, what are some of the risk factors for this cancer? And Darlene, did you have any risk factors that you know of? I did not. Um, the risk factors that they tell me are, um, I, they say smoking, um, age, hepatitis C. Um, I did not have any of these risk factors. So that was a big yeah. surprise. I didn't have any risk factors either, Darlene. So it was a surprise to me. Um, Dr. Ayer, do you want to touch on any other risk factors that are associated with cholangiocarcinoma? No, you guys hit them all. And for gallbladder cancer, it's also gallstones. Um, so there are certain geographic areas where gallbladder cancer is a little bit more prevalent. And, uh, and so some of it has to do um, again, with inherent susceptibility in those populations. Yeah, PSC, any, any kind of inflammation to the, the bile ducts, right? I mean, can typically be a, a risk factor. Yeah, okay. Um, 
So are there different types of cholangiocarcinoma? Do you want to talk about the different types, Dr. Iyer? Absolutely. So, um, you know, in, we have different classifications for cholangiocarcinoma, and uh, uh, so we can go into two, three different ways that they're classified. So when we talk about types, when you talk about location, that could be one way that the type is determined. You know, the ones that develop within the in, within the bile ducts inside the liver is called intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. The ones just at the junction between the inside and the outside are called perihilar cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, extrahepatic is the bile duct outside uh, the liver, and then there's gallbladder. So those are all, and there's also ampullary at the very end of the bile duct. So by location is one type. Another thing that uh, is another way of classifying them is the histology, meaning that the pathologist looks under the microscope and for the majority of patients when we're saying cholangiocarcinoma, we're referring to adenocarcinoma or adenocarcinoma, which is the gland, the bile duct. But in some patients, they get a slightly different histology. So it started there, but it's not an adenocarcinoma. It's either mixed, it's adenosquamous or papillary, or neuroendocrine or something a little bit, you know, different. And some patients get cholangiocarcinoma and liver cancer at the same time. So it's a mixed type of, you know, uh, tumor. Uh, so those are just a couple of different ways that we, we classify them. Okay, wonderful. Um, so Darlene, where did you find um, support or some of your resources? I found support, um, specific support I could think of is the Facebook group that's confidential and it's specific to cholangiocarcinoma patients. So that was great because you felt like you could say, um, you know, there was there's confidence in there and there was experience in there and that was very helpful. Um, emotional support and logistics support came through my resource of family and friends. Yeah, it's wonderful. I also got support when I was first diagnosed. Um, I found the, the cholangiocarcinoma foundation and reached out on their discussion board and connected with other patients, which was very helpful to me as well. Um, so should we talk about maybe what are some of the typical symptoms of cholangiocarcinoma? Dr. Iyer? Oh, absolutely. Um, one, of the, one of the commonest symptoms, um, and, and maybe, you know, Kristen can chime in if she has some data from her um, surveys as well. Many patients I see were asymptomatic, actually, um, when they went in and it was incidentally found. Uh, like, for example, for gallbladder, they go in thinking they have gallstones and then unfortunately the tumor uh, was found. Painless jaundice, getting yellow, you know, skin, eyes, uh, and, and presenting that way is another very common symptom. And then for some a little bit more advanced, um, pain, ascites, buildup of fluid in their belly, abnormal liver function tests uh, can be other symptoms that patients have. Okay. Um, so, Kristen, the last question is going to go to you. What were the most important things that Insight learned from the patient survey and how will it influence how Insight works with patients in the future? That's a good question to uh, wrap things up here. Um, so we, we learned a number of things from the survey. Having the ability to tap into 700 patient stories really just illuminated a lot of um, things that we don't know about the patient and their perspective. So I found that to be kind of the, the most critical take home piece of that survey, the ability to understand what's bothering you, what's keeping you from getting to, to visits, what kind of barriers um, in support or travel, um, those types of things were evaluated in the survey. Um, we understood, I think for the very first time, the impact that mental health plays in, in the, the cholangiocarcinoma patient's journey. Um, we, we also explored, um, you know, I, as I said earlier, the impact that some of these patients have in their work status. We had a number of patients who were on the younger end of the age spectrum and were still trying to hold jobs. They may be parents, they may be caring for elderly parents, and all of a sudden they're experiencing this new journey and this new 
responsibility for caring for themselves that may maybe they hadn't experienced up until that point. And then the mindset has to shift. And what what kind of impact does that have on the patient, both physically and so social emotionally? Um, so that was that was very important for us to learn. I think there's a lot that we continue to learn clinically speaking. Um, the biomarker testing and the ability to get, a, you know, a, co a confirmed correct diagnosis, um, particularly in the asymptomatic population. But the survey allowed us this insight into not just the clinical course of the patient's disease, but how they how they felt about it, how it impacts their lives and their their families' lives. Um, so I think that that was a tremendous. Um, just wealth of data, and we're so grateful to the patients that that participated. We we could not have been more pleased with the openness that we heard from the patients who participated. So we're very we're very yeah. thankful. Yes, thank you so much. And you know, we hope we can use the results of this survey to better meet the patient needs for sure. So those were all great questions. And to conclude today's discussion, I want to again thank our panel of speakers and the audience for tuning in um, through today's sec discussion. We hope you learned a little bit about cholangiocarcinoma and, um, and the patient journey or the journey of a loved one who lives with this disease. The video of today's discussion will be available on the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation Facebook page for your reference and to share with others. Um, if you're interested in learning more about cholangiocarcinoma, please visit cholangiocarcinoma.org for more resources or to connect with, um, with, with me or anyone there. And as a reminder, this information is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice. Please consult your doctor with any specific questions you have about your disease and your care. Thank you all so much for tuning in and joining us. And thank you, panel, for being here with us. Everyone take care and have a good night. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.